guess I'll have to start. Um, should we start with a joke or jump right into the material? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. A chicken and an egg are lying in bed after sex. The egg looks over at the chicken and said, no, I guess we answered that question. <laughs> okay. I love this topic. Um, I think this topic is so important for us to be talking about because it's something that isn't being talked about, frankly. Um, I've done a few interviews recently on podcasts where the people report back to me that the people that listen to their show and even the interviewers are saying, I didn't know half, 80%, 70% of the things you were talking about because that's one of my missions is to get us talking about this. So um, this is happening. Right? It's rampant. We have high speed computers, all of us, in our pocket. So do teens, so do kids. And one of the thing, things that can be difficult about as clinicians working with this is that we all have our own filters too. We all have our own relationship or no relationship with pornography. So it's easy to misdiagnose, to overdiagnose or underdiagnose if somebody comes in with a compulsive or addictive problem with porn. So that's one of the things that I think if we're going to be working with porn addicts, let me just quickly check how many of you have ever worked with somebody who has any sort of problematic or addictive problem with pornography in your practice? Okay, quite a lot. Um, so some of what we talk about today is going to remind you of things you've heard and some isn't. Um, I think it's so important that we as clinicians do our work in general, but specifically when we're talking to anybody about sex or pornography that we are talking to someone in our own lives, even if that means that we abhor pornography, never watched it, hate it, or if we have our own issues with it or anywhere in between, that we're able to at least talk to someone about it for ourselves so that when we're sitting in the room with the client, we can be regulated. We can listen to them talk about porn in a way that may not line up with our values. So that we're not telling them what they should or shouldn't be doing because we think it's right. I'm not standing, I say this on a street corner, with a sandwich board saying, if you watch porn, come into my office, I can help you stop. Because maybe that person doesn't want to stop. Maybe it's not a problem for them. The second reason I think it's so important is we all know that when somebody has an addiction, and they go to, let's say, a 12-step program, and they become sober, that suddenly all of their uh, trauma, their emotional issues, anything that's been driving them uh, poorly in their lives, it just magically disappears, and they're perfectly healthy, right? <laughs> no, wrong. In fact, that is the moment where we can start working with people and all that was driving their addiction in the first place. Why do they want a pathological reason to not be in the now, right? To soothe, to numb, to medicate, to distract. So we as clinicians, we are able to be with that, but we can only do it when that drug or behavior isn't running their lives. The second thing is, let's take alcoholism for a second. We can't look at someone and say, because you drink um, Jack Daniels or you drink Bud Light, that that tells us something about your family of origin or something about your unresolved issues or what's driving you. With porn addiction, sometimes we can. Sometimes we can look at what was their drug of choice within their drug of choice and it can help lead us to what were the things that were driving them because I believe a lot of porn addicts are trying to resolve, resolve unresolved emotional material through what they watch. The problem is it doesn't work. I'd say the biggest problem is they don't even know they're doing it, right? They just say, that's just what I find hot. So as you'll see when we get into the latter stages here of talking about this, there is no A equals B as far as if you watch this type of pornography, it means this about you or your childhood. That's just not true. But it can start to give us a roadmap as we work with them and their families of origin and the things that have driven them and their traumas that we can start to put together a puzzle of where to apply the healing and love. Does that make sense? So today, we're going to talk about five different things. Hello. Hi. We got two seats right up front, if you like. Or there's others, I just realized. We're going to start by talking a little bit about pornography and its effects. We're then going to talk about pornography as an addiction. Then, how to assess for it. Like I said before, there's several assessment tools that are in here and that you can continue to find online that can help actually you as a clinician saying, I don't know if this person's a porn addict or not, that you can actually rely on these things and work with the client to figure it out.
I once, many, many years ago, had a client come in and say, with just steeped in shame, saying, I'm a porn addict, I'm out of control, I need help. And I said, okay. So we started talking. One of the things I asked was, how often are you watching porn? And he said, with his head hanging low, about once a month. And he was horrified to, and, and uh, also is one of the reasons I love working in this field is sometimes I'm the first person, as you've probably experienced as well, the first person they've ever told this. I have a problem with pornography or I can't stop. Now, was this person an addict? Once a month, it would be very easy for us to write that up and say, no, of course not, I'm not watching it enough. He disagreed. We can talk about why. Then we're going to talk about how to treat it, what to do, and finally, processing the underlying emotions as far as the type of pornography they're watching, or at least how to get us on that roadmap to finding those things. All in one hour, we're going to do this. Um, and Alex told me that uh, we're going to wrap up around 2.30, but then we have from 2.30 to 2.45 for questions and answers. So um, I tend to be pretty verbose, but I'm going to try to keep us right to 2.30. And then if you have questions, please make a note, write them down, and we'll do, deal with that at the end if there's anything we want to talk about and we have that time. So let's talk about why, uh, th what is the upside of porn? Because there is one, right? If it was just all bad, let's say, then uh, it wouldn't be the problem that it is. It can be educational. It can be educational in a good way. So what do people look like naked, right? What goes where? What are the different ways that people can have sex? Uh, people learn. It can be fun and exciting. That's part of the upside, part of the downside as well. Uh, it can be shame reducing. So people can get freedom from messages of shame towards sexuality that they learned in their families of origin and be able to realize like, oh, I get it. Uh, this is something people do and these people seem to be okay with it. Another thing is as far as homosexual and bisexual people have said, some of the first times they were ever actually to, uh, able to express their sexuality was by watching pornography. Here are other people like me doing the things I want to do and it can bring that shame down. It's normalizing. Experimental, it can be sexy, it can be confidence building in the ways I was just talking about. And then it's normalizing of masturbation for teenagers. So if they're making this, they're only making it for the purpose of masturbation. So what I'm doing is okay. I remember when I was in high school, someone admitting that they masturbated, it was like, uh, it, there wasn't even a diagnosis for, it's like, are you gay? Are you weird? Are you a pervert? Everybody was doing it, or most people I should say. But to admit it wasn't okay. So here's like a normalizing thing. When people start to talk about, oh, I watch porn, you watch porn. Oh, okay. It's normalizing. Oh, I see. We all have these sexual urges. It's okay that I actually do this thing. And then it's soothing or distracting from unpleasant emotions, right? Like a lot of things. That can be a really good thing. Some people sit on their couch at 11 o'clock on a Friday night and they eat Ben and Jerry's peanut butter cup ice cream. I've heard. <laughs> But of course, like things, unless it becomes a pathological relationship to it, soothing and distracting things in our lives, it helps us. So why is pornography a problem? Well, let's go back to sex education. In general, not everything of course, but in general, sex is made by men for men, right? It's optical. It's what we want to watch, what they want people to watch in order to become aroused so they can masturbate. So it is miseducating a lot of people. Mostly people who have no idea. Um, there are studies that break my heart and make me roll my eyes about teenagers who are having their first sexual experiences. Some of you are already nodding your head. And what some things that are happening without consent and without discussion that are very normal in porn but pretty abnormal in real sexual life. So 15, 16, 17-year-old girls saying, yeah, the first time I ever had sex, this is how the man finished it. She had no idea that was happening. She didn't consent to it, but he, if it's a heterosexual duo, believes that that's how sex ends, you see. Another quick thing I forgot to say. Um, there are no sexual or pornographic images here, nor am I going to gratuitously use any language, but from time to time, like just a second ago, I'm going to be talking about actual things that happen in sex, in pornography, I should say. So I trust that if anybody needs to take care of themselves, if that's triggering or anything like that, that you can take a break and take care of yourselves. But again, it's nothing gratuitous in this whole thing. Um, and I also forgot to say that I don't take a religious or moral or ethical a stance on porn. I just don't. If you do, I I'm great with that, right? And I'd love to hear all about that, actually. But 
This presentation is more about how do we work with this as clinicians, right? And how do we meet the clients where they are, regardless of how we personally feel about it? So where were we? Oh, so it, it, like I just said a second ago, oh, there's abuse and exploitation within the industry that we know. And then as I was describing it in many different ways, there's abuse and exploitation because of pornography. Story after story after story we hear. So the norms of sex are being defined by pornography. Because like it or not, most people are watching it. I am so happy that high speed internet did not exist when I was a teenager. Right? I escaped that. I didn't have a smartphone. They didn't exist. Um, but kids and teens now, they have access. What kid, what teenager wouldn't Google sex or boobs or penis or butts or whatever it is that they don't understand but want to see more of? So when I was a kid, you'd see, you know, I'd catch a picture in a Playboy magazine, let's say, of a naked person. And that was like overload. That was shocking to my system. That's nothing. That's like rated G compared to what these kids can do and quicker, right? They can do it all the time and wherever they want. So the impact on society too. Um, there's a term I've heard over and over again, um, which is porn ready. That men and women come to believe that they need to be porn ready. So for men, that means if you're in a sexual situation, you should have an erect penis, period, and without any problem. That for women, let's say, you need to look like this, you need to perform like this, and you need to receive sexual pleasure from the type of things that women in porn receive sexual pleasure from. Um, also, fashion. We were out just the other night, and there was, we had an argument over if the a girl was 14 or 15 years old. And you've seen this, we've all seen it. She was with her dad, um, and her family, I should say, and was wearing uh, cut-off jean shorts where her buttocks were literally visible beneath the jeans. So I can't sit here and say that that's wrong or bad, but she is walking around with fashion that is meant to sexualize her. For individuals, why is pornography a problem? Well, inherently, it's not, unless it is. And that's where we come in. So this is the evolution of modern pornography. I'm not going to spend much time talking about this to this to this. We all kind of know this. We've seen it. We've heard it. Right here is where the world changed with pornography free streaming internet porn, okay? Now, I thought, I was saying high-speed internet porn for quite some time is like, that's when the world changed. And I think there's some truth to that too. But this, and if you haven't heard it or heard of it, there is a serial podcast called, and this is not in the notes, The Butterfly Effect. If you haven't heard it and you're interested in this topic, download it. As soon as you download my podcast, <laughs> download this one, The Butterfly Effect. Because what it does is, this host tracks down the person in the world who created the first streaming internet tube channel, like YouTube, and talks about how it happened, all that he was up against, and in the ways it developed. And then he traces the butterfly effect around the world in the years that follows of how it changed the industry for users of porn, for creators of porn, and everything in between. It's fascinating. This is where everything changed. Why? Because they figured out, like YouTube did brilliantly, how to keep you on there for hours and hours and hours. If my brother sends me a clip, you got to see this dog and a kitten playing, right? YouTube is, <laughs> YouTube's not a person, but I'll say it as if it is. YouTube is smart as hell. Because what they say is, wait a minute, if this guy likes this, he's going to like the funny cat and dog video compilation over here. He's going to like this animal and that animal playing. He's gonna, and they tell me what I'm going to watch. And by the way, they're usually right. So I go on there to see this funny video of the cat and the dog. I'm on here forever. And what happens? This is how they get paid, right? Me watching this counts for this person advertising. And then, of course, you can click on Tide. I never have, uh, uh, but, but we can. And go watch that commercial, and then they make even more money. So. This is what porn, you know, this, this guy that you'll hear about if you listen to this um, podcast said, why not for porn? And what happened is this, these tube sites is what they're called. They're not creating any content, right? They're creating a platform where people can put on things from the past, put on things they made one minute ago, put on things that were made last week, and you can just go watch it for free. And when the original producers come and say, hey, this is illegal, I produce this and I'm getting paid for it, no problem, they take it down. And what happens? Somebody puts it right back up. 
That's their business model. They know this. So what happens in pornography, and I've heard so many men talk about, and, and by the way, I'm biased of knowing how men and pornography addiction works because that's who shows up in my office. Obviously, there are women who struggle with this, and I've talked to many of them, but men show up to me. So um, that's, that's a bit of what I know best here because of the years of anecdotal discussions we've had. And what happens is they say, if you like this type of porn, you'll like this too. It's the same performers or it's the same type or whatever. And by the way, three is, and just like this would be on YouTube, it's all down here and you scroll down, it goes and goes and goes. And some of the time, there will be things a little darker, a little more visceral, a little more violent than what you were watching or what you were looking for. You would have never Googled this thing down here. But here's a, a picture of it. Hmm, I'll check that out. And that leads people to watching things that they didn't initially come on for. And this is what led to people having 12 tabs open, 20 tabs open, because they're just searching and, get, and just consuming, and they get into this trance. So it has led people Gonzo porn is a type of pornography where it's not like, let's say, pornography in the 80s and 90s where they would have a plot and they would have a set and lights and cameras and they would be on location at a beach or in a house or whatever it is and you know, they would stumble through their lines and try to make it like these are actual people. Gonzo porn is different. It's a scene. It's a video camera or an iPhone or whatever it is they can record on. And what they, I'm going to skip down here for just a second. High speed internet free streaming pornography is what led to porn changing to meet the wants and needs of the viewers because they're consuming it at an alarming rate and then their tastes change. What I used to watch no longer excites me, we're going to talk about why, but now I need something different. So this, what provides, what these tube sites provide is something different all the time. Since we started this lecture, I don't know, 20, 100, 500 new clips have been put online. It's infinite. So it's because they could just consume it in any fashion and things that someone might look for for a whole lifetime and never be able to find. Something that's abusive or something that we might look at and say, oh, that's disturbing material. They can find that in two seconds, right? Any of us could. So it's very low budget, very easy to make and edit, and then they just put it up online. Gritty, visceral, extreme genital close-ups, much more than these plot-driven, so to speak, uh, uh, pornography that, that was true in the 80s, 90s, and even in the 2000s. Um, and then it started becoming much more hu humiliating, much more abusive, right? More intense. And I say different from fetishes. Fetishes exist, but fetishes, th what we're talking about is an overall intensity, violence, and humiliation that is in what people call vanilla porn. What vanilla porn means is you're just your everyday porn. The thing, oh, I just like vanilla porn. And as we're going to talk about later, that means something different to everybody. So dopamine. <coughs> dopamine is one of the things that is the engine to pornography addiction. It's a feel-good <coughs> chemical in the brain. Dopamine is kind of awesome. It narrows our focus, right? It lights us up, and it, and it says, I need more of this. This is different. This is, um, you know, they talk about in the past, if, if, if we are in the cavemen days and we're walking down a path we've seen a hundred times, but suddenly there's something different over there, I need to know what that is. That's one of the reasons our brain focuses on it. Is that danger? Is that food? Is that someone I know? Do I need to run or do I need to move toward it? So dopamine, the forebrain interprets cocaine use, porn, and gaming in a similar, similar fashion. They hyper-stimulate the dopamine cycle. So dopamine is not evil, right? It's not bad. It's not a villain. It serves a great function. But what internet porn does is it hyper-stimulates it because the person watching it knows that they're being voyeuristic. There's not another person in the room. Their brain knows this. It's all fantasy. So it can be a dopamine field day. And it thrives on variety. What does the internet and what does high-speed porn have other than variety? So if what turned you on this morning is now boring to you, don't worry, right? There's 50, 60, 70 new things just like it you can watch that are going to be different. And the dopamine says, thank you, right? It's this neurochemical that's going off like fireworks in the brain. So the brain becomes dependent on the dopamine hit, not necessarily the pornography, but we, you know, it's kind of a joke. Like porn addiction is a chemical addiction. It's a neurochemical addiction. The brain says, give me more. And what eventually happens is that these dopamine receptors in the brain say, too much, 
just like we do with, uh, with alcohol, with drugs. The brain says, uh-uh, I can't, I can't handle all of this. They start to blunt themselves against it, so they need, they start to develop a tolerance, and they need more and more. However, what is tolerance in alcoholism? What does it mean? Drink more. Right. It used to take three beers, and I would get drunk, right? Then it takes six beers, then it takes seven beers plus a shot of Jack Daniels, and on and on and on. That's measured in volume. I used to need this much, now I need this much. In porn addiction, tolerance is measured by variety. This used to turn me on. Now this is boring. I have talked to so many men who have, when I explain this to them, they say, you just described the last five, six years of my life. I like this. Suddenly that just wasn't hot anymore. Then I needed this. And some, not all, some go to the depths of watching these traumatic videos, and I'll never forget one young man, he must have been in his mid-twenties, say, in a group we had, I can never unsee some of the things that I've seen. This one person said that he eventually was watching things that weren't even sexual in nature and masturbating to them. They were just violent. Traumatized him. So, now, that's an extreme case, by the way. But that's what happens. It's like, I need something, and, and you will talk to people who, if they stay away from porn and then they go back to it, vanilla porn is just fine for them. Their body, their brain, it's on full tilt. But then the more they watch it, then they go, now this is boring. Give me something different, more hardcore, more visceral, more dangerous, more violent, a lot of the time. Yeah, please. Yep. Is it just what you're, what you, who you are within? Like I used to smoke cigarettes. And yeah. I was addicted to nicotine. Yeah. I'm not addicted to anything, and I was over there. Yeah. But I could, I mean, the minute I smoked, it was like, I. I that was I, your thing. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. so just that it, it, yep. So. Porn, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about this later too, is like porn becomes their drug of choice. It becomes something that is filling some need inside of them to begin with, okay. and then their psychology says, "Holy shit." This is what I want, this is what I need, this is what takes care of me, and more and more and more happens. You bet. So um, the ding on your cell phone when you get a text message, that's dopamine. Yeah. That's what happens inside of us. Uh, email, checking our email, Facebook, Instagram, knew this, knew that, so-and-so comment, anything, that's dopamine, right? All of those things, but none of them flood you with dopamine like this high-speed internet porn. So. Online, oh funny, there's like a, a little shadow there, isn't there? Um, well, I thought it was going away, I thought it was like an effect. No, it's not, <laughs> it's not. Uh, so online porn has been called the crack cocaine, Patrick Harnes was I think the person who coined, coined this phrase, of sexual compulsivity because no real life partner can compete with the dopamine blasts created by internet pornography. Is that to say that internet porn is better than real sex? I have yet to meet the, well, actually, got to be honest, I have met a few people who have said that. But no, no, it's not. It's nowhere near as fulfilling. There's no connection. However, dopamine, yes. It will hyperstimulate dopamine in a way, um, oh, right, that no real life partner could. Now, what if you are the partner of a porn addict? How might that feel? I've talked to a lot of them. Rejecting, maybe? feeling bad about the way they look or who they are, feeling like they're not good enough, not sexy enough. Why am I not being a good enough boyfriend, spouse, girlfriend, partner? Because they have no idea that they cannot compete. No, I'm just tired, I'm just tired, I'm just tired. What, for months? Meanwhile, this person is, has a rich sexual life. It's just happening behind closed doors and with the screen. So the other thing is, Patrick Harnes talks about, um, and he's the godfather of the treatment of all sex addiction, um, that they do inpatient treatment for sex addiction. And after time, obviously, they were able to start saying, oh, we, we can start to see people getting into categories here. They come from overly enmeshed homes, or they come from very cold and distant homes. They come from rigid boundaries where there was absolutely no passing, or they come from enmeshed, non-existent boundaries. They could start to say, not 100%, but they say, we really see people are fitting into this big category who show up for treatment for sex addiction on an inpatient level. Suddenly, that became less and less true. People started showing up with none of that addictive template. None of the, you know, you, we've all heard people say, I have an addictive personality. No, people were coming in where they're like, wait, how does this person line up? This is why. This is why. 
because it can create addiction where there isn't an addictive template. Does it always? Of course not, right? Just like if someone with an addictive personality doesn't necessarily become a porn addict. But it started showing up where they said, wait a minute, this is creating addiction because of what happens in the brain. Now, I can't say I've ever experienced this because I haven't, but that's the same thing I've heard about crack cocaine. You could be this or that, hey, you wanna, I don't know, smoke crack, I don't know, sure. And suddenly the brain and the body say, this is what I've been waiting for all my life, right? Without knowing they needed it in the first place. We said this. So it's an intimacy killer. At least it can be. When it becomes addictive or compulsive, it almost has to be. The brain attaches to the porn experience. Not necessarily the performers, but the experience. So again, doubling down here. The brain becomes adjusted to this heightened dopamine. Dopam <laughs> I, could set it, I said it right when I was practicing. <laughs> Dopaminergic experience. That person-to-person -person contact cannot create, right? So it creates a routine and the brain becomes wired around this is my sex life now. Which is what? It's isolated, it's visceral <laughs> in that way, it's in control, self-centered, detached from other human beings. I'm not demonizing it. I'm just saying this is what it is. It's a person by themselves where they're in complete control. They can control what they say, who they see, what, what the, uh, the porn person looks like, and they can even control the angles. Oh, I don't like that body part. Let me fast forward or not even fast forward. That's old school. Let me jump immediately to the angles that turn me on. So it's this compartmentalized view of sex that you are in charge of. Where's the room for a partner in that? I've heard over and over and over again, especially with men in their 20s, who then get in the room with a real life partner and their brain and their body are like a record scratch. Mm -hmm. There are enough people in this room who are old enough to remember what that means. It's like the party killer. It's like, what, what? The brain's like, wait, I, what do I do here? This isn't, what, this isn't what turns me on anymore. And yeah, I, I, um, I compare it to Candy Crush versus reading a book. I mean, people write, love reading, right? They could devour it. Start playing Candy Crush for a week or two, then go read a book. You will be bored out of your fucking mind, right? <laughs> There's no dopamine. There's no excitement at Candy Crush, and I've played it. It's amazing at, just like YouTube, keeping you playing. It's a brilliant, brilliant game because it just stimulates this is going off in your brain. They've created it that way. So it takes something that's absolutely wonderful, beautiful, pleasurable, right? We learn from it, we enjoy it, we escape, and it turns it into something boring, or it can. And then I've heard this before. It's like husbands, wives, uh, partners saying, oh my God, I can't wait till they leave the house so I can shoot up, so to speak, right? So I can use my drug of choice. Okay, uh, any questions right now? I must have covered everything. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because I do have a woman who's been 23 now and has been watching porn since she was 13. Sure, yeah. Percentage of uh, male porn addicts versus female porn addicts? We don't know. All we know is who shows up for treatment. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, it's also been very difficult to do any sort of porn-related studies because how do you get a control group? How do you find people who do not watch porn, have not watched porn, to come in and be your baseline? Um, As I say, and this is, to this is a very, very narrow view, I know I hang up my flag, I say I treat this and this is what I do, men come to my office. Um, but there are a, a lot of women I've met personally and professionally who absolutely are addicted or struggle with this. And if there's a stigma, which there is, for men coming forward and saying, I'm addicted to pornography, that takes a lot of courage, we're gonna talk about that later. How might it feel for a woman to come forward because it's so much less normalized. It's more normalized for men to say, oh my God, I watch so much porn, it's ruining my life. But for women that come forward, I've heard women say this, it's like, who do I talk to? Because they feel ashamed of it. So yet again, as clinicians, I think it's our job to, with the people sitting in front of us, to be able to, to create that safe space that they can talk about it even if they do have shame about it. And I wish I had, I've wondered before, I wish we just had this perfect like crystal ball that could tell us the exact answer to questions like these, but we just don't know. Um, how do we assess? So first of all, in our, in, if we're starting with a new client, by the way. This is all old news. 
I'm not going to go through it. This is your standard clinical interview, starting with informed consent, talking about why are we here, tell me about you, what's happening in your life, why did you call right now, are there any crises happening in your life. So you're just going to do your normal clinical interview just to start off with how you're treating this person. When we're talking about someone who calls because of porn, you need to get the statistics. And don't be afraid to ask about specifics of these types of things. So we're going to talk about what specifics to avoid and what specifics to move toward. These specifics are, this is obviously, like, let me say this. If a client is coming to you and they're saying, I'm a porn addict or I have a problem with porn, their house is on fire, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. They're in a crisis. Because my guess is, even if it's just an existential crisis, right, or it could be literally like my family's falling apart, my spouse find out, my kids, I might lose everything, or I got fired, or I got arrested, or this or that. We need to just find out, like we're starting to paint a clinical picture of why are you in my office right now? How often do you watch porn? How long do you watch for? Where do you watch it? What devices do you use? And we'll stop here for the moment. What are the consequences of your watching of pornography. That gets us started. And I encourage all of us to open our minds to what other questions come from their answers. I watch it at work, someone might say to you. What questions come to your mind? Can you get fired if you get caught? Can you get fired if you get caught? Yep. I had a client that did get fired. Yep. Oh, you're not alone, right? Yeah. Uh, where are you watching it at work? What device are you watching it at work? Are you watching in the bathroom? Are you watching in your in your office, is the door open? Is the door locked? Do you have a window? Are they monitoring your computer? Mm -hmm. I ask that several times. You know what answer comes back sometimes? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know, are they? I say, yep. That's great, right. So how many hours you're at work? Like, and that goes right to like, can you be fired for this? It's like, it, who knows that you're doing this? Maybe someone does. Maybe the tech guy is sitting in an office knows exactly how much and what types of porn that person's watching. But some of the times, and this is beautiful in addiction because it circumvents the prefrontal cortex, right, which is where logical, linearity, empathy, understanding, it just circumvents that and they think, oh my God, I never thought about could they be monitoring what I'm watching right now. So I watch it at home. Okay, I watch it, you know, let's say they have a family. Okay, when do you watch it? After this or that, well, what does your spouse think? What do you tell your spouse you're doing? Have you been caught? So just allowing yourself to enter their world like, like we do anyway, but with these types of questions. We're just starting to understand what is the life of this person who called me because their house is on fire. Now, we're going to wait on what types of pornography. That's going to be the last part of what we talk about here today. Um, and then are there legal or safety concerns? This is part of any informed consent, right? However, we need to have gone through our informed consent before we ask this question. We need to warn them. First of all, well, what are some legal concerns? Because they're watching child porn. Okay. Underage porn. Yep. Reportable. What else? Is there children present? Children present while they're watching it, right? Are, have, are there children walking in the room and there's pornography on the screen? Um, are you doing it uh, in public? Can you get arrested? Are you watching porn in your car where a police officer walking down the streets or someone calling, you know, and many others. It's like to, to actually cover, just remember, I have to report this, this, and this when I ask you these questions. Legal and safety concerns, the reason I say be really careful, you nailed it, um, among many others is this law. Anybody know this law? A lot of people know this law. Who can tell us what it is? What is it? <laughs> Do you know it? Uh, uh, yes, actually, this is more specific. Okay. Child, yep, you're right. We are legally mandated to report child abuse. And this is a law that happened January 1st, 2015, that says if you are a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, an MFT, an LCSW, a teacher, or a police officer, maybe I'm missing some. You are now required to report your client to the authorities if they tell you they have knowingly downloaded, streamed, or viewed underage pornography once. So I say, Joe, you know, you could walk in here and say, um, I just killed my wife yesterday. I can't report you, right? That's not reportable. If you were to come in and say, five years ago, I watched a video of a 16-year-old man having sex, I got to call the cops. 
So I actually have this in my informed consent as an entire paragraph in bold and make them initial that paragraph because of this type of work, because these are some, some of the people I work with. If, and by the way, I hate this law. I'm all for Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and I'm sure others. Those have been cracking down. People get arrested, they get put in prison for, for watching, viewing, and creating, of course, this. So it's abhorrent, and I'm all on board for doing whatever they need to do to shut this down. But when people come into our office and say, I need help, I want to stop doing this, I have to call the cops. And by the way, before this law, working here at CHS, I did help people. People who said, I hate this and I need to stop. I wish I didn't want to do this. And people who said, I should just be able to keep doing this. Is it OK? And guess what happened? They stopped. We helped them. There was someone in the room to say, no, you're not a monster. No, I'm not going to run from the room. No, I don't hate you. You just need help. You can't stop watching underage pornography. Let's help you. So this law changes that. We can't do that anymore. So I say to people, if ever that's been true, you can talk about it. You just can't say that it was underage. You ha or I say, I hate the law, but I'm going to comply. I just don't think this is the way. By the way, zero therapists were consulted in creating this law. Just so you know, it was lawyers. It was all lawyers. Their intention was good, obviously. But the outcome of it means we can't, help, we can't sit with somebody and say, let's talk about exactly what's happening in your life. So be careful. And if you're going to work with porn addicts, Know this law like the back of your hand and tell them this. And again, I tell these people, I, d I wouldn't want to call. And by the way, what happens 99% of the time is people, they, they make a joke of it. Because they're just like, oh, it's not, trust me, that's not a problem. That won't be happening. Okay, fine. But we've covered it. Better than them stumbling into it. But we got to be aware of that. Wow, time is flying. Okay. So here, and you have these slides, are several different assessment tools for porn. This is the one I use on, for porn addiction. I'm sorry. This is the one I have on my website. It's five questions. I found this one. I was like, this to me is it. And it says here, one or more could indicate that there's a problem. So I'm going to quickly go through these. And then the rest of them you have in your handout. Have you had ongoing but unsuccessful attempts to stop, reduce, or control your porn use? I've tried, and I can't stop. Have you spent inordinate amounts of time watching pornography or recovering from it to the extent, right? like other things we, we assess for, that it has taken time away from occupational, social, domestic, or academic obligations. I'm falling behind at work. I, didn't, I missed my kid's uh, uh, basketball game. You know, I didn't get my final done, or I, I crushed this. I just crashed on my final at school because I was up binging it for porn, you know, with porn for many nights in a row. Um, has there been harmful consequences to your relationship or sex life due to your porn use? And to me, those two scream addiction. It's hurting my life, and I can't stop. Do you need to watch more visceral or violent types of pornography than you used to in order to become aroused by porn? We talked about that. Do you become irritable, restless, or annoyed if you are unable to watch porn? There are withdrawal symptoms. If somebody is addicted, there will be withdrawal symptoms. Usually, it shows up mentally and emotionally for porn addiction and sex addiction. However, it can be physical as well. And then this happens. And I warn people of that. We'll get to that in a second. So again, is this, this is basically, let's have this conversation, right? Let's, you and I, read this together. Let's hear what you said yes and no to. And by the way, I like it when people do this before they come to see me. CHS does the same thing. The internet sex sc uh, addiction screening test right here, this is about online behavior. CHS has this on their website. You can Google this, by the way, and get it. It's 20 or 25 questions. It gives you the key. And I just put these on here uh, for fun. The SAS, the Sex Addiction Screening Test, that's, um, it's been expanded to 40 or 45 questions. You can get it online. Your clients can get it online. But this is sex addiction as a whole, not just porn addiction. And again, take it. Bring in, I'd rather talk about the yeses and nos rather than count them and tell you if you're an addict or not. Let's get this to lead us into, I mean, we need to talk about it. If, some, if the norm is, let's say, six or more, and they score 12, we have to talk about that. But let's talk about the yeses. Tell me more. So this is, th this, this, it gives you a bit of a roadmap on where to go. And then this is SDI, the Sexual Dependency Inventory. This is um, certified sex addiction therapists have access to this. It's about a two, two and a half hour test. It's now taken online. Uh, I should say assessment tool, it's not a test. Um, and then the clinician gets all of this 
information. But again, like I said, that's a specific thing. CHS does that. Other people do that. But it's, that is the most, one of the most comprehensive things they can do before coming to see you. Um, pathos, pathos is a six question porn addiction uh, um, and sex addiction actually um, assessment tool. You can just look this up, have your client look, tell them, hey, what's a yes, what's a no for you? And then finally, the 10 diagnostic criteria. These are the same, right, for drug and alcohol as well. Three or more indicates the presence of most likely that there is an addiction present. It's all, these are all on your sheets too. So, once we're done assessing, what do we do now? And I have a lot of people come in and they'll say, um, you know, we look at these assessment tools, they give their yeses, they give their noes. They want me to tell them if they're a porn addict. Okay, well, that's kind of what we signed up for. So, we can use whatever language works for us, right? And if you think the answer is yes from all that you're talking to, you can say, from everything I'm hearing and everything that we're looking at with these assessment tools, it seems like the answer is yes. How does that feel? How does that hit you? Do you agree? Um, that's a great way to have somebody, you know, um, I don't know, say nice to meet you, goodbye, is just to tell them, oh, I know more than you about you, so yeah, you're a porn addict. And maybe they are, but I, all of it, like all that we do, it's a joining process. Can we walk together through this? Can we see how does that sound? And how would it feel to you for someone to say that? Yeah, you're an addict, you're a porn addict, you're an alcoholic, okay. So to actually be with them as we go through it rather than being the person on high, that's just not, I don't think that's what, what, what we do. It's not, not, not what I do. Um, what do we do? So let's say they do qualify as a porn addict. So, I say we have to meet them with compassion. I cannot tell you how many men I have met who come into my office, tell me their secrets, and 50 minutes later walk out the door and they look like they weigh 500 pounds less. Because this secret that they've been carrying on their shoulders and hiding from the people who know them and love them best, they've just told a complete stranger, what do they get? Understanding, compassion, dare I say some love. Okay, help is here right? We can deal with this. You're not alone. Compassion, to me that's everything. Well, that's the beginning of everything. Combined with, now I'm a Rogerian therapist. That's it. That's who I am as a person. I could fake it for about five minutes on something else, but I, I can't change who I am. However, you can have someone come in your office saying, my house is on fire, and you say, I really hear you, and that must be really difficult for you, and that, you know, you seem very hurt and sad, and I can walk through this with you. We'll see you next week. Like, we have to tell them how we can help. What we're gonna look at here is a grab bag. I think some of these are mandatory, others aren't. But things that you can say, yes, this fits, this fits. Here's what you can do, come back next week, let's see how that went. Because it's containing for someone who's saying, I can't stop, it's ruining my life. Okay, here's your homework, here's your plan, let's see you next week. Um, oh, right here. Imagine how it feels to have the courage to discuss these with a stranger. There's a class at CHS where um, we do once a year that, that Alex and uh, myself and others teach. And um, there's an SDI, like I said earlier, but the paper version. So people feel well, all the zeros through fives and I did this, yes, I've done that, this is powerful, this is not. They spend you know, an hour or two on this and they come in and I start the class with a joke. I say, what each, but I don't tell them it's a joke. I say, some of you have taken this class, you know. Each of you is going to come up here one by one and we're going to read through your answers, right? And that they get it immediately that I'm like, okay, this can't be true. But that jolt, I say, remember that feeling, okay? Remember that feeling because that's what your clients are dealing with. They're coming in here, they're talking to you about like the depth of their sexual soul. Can you remember what it felt like when you thought you were going to have to come up here and do that? So I, I believe these people to be so unbelievably courageous and I let them know that too. And we check in, right, in the very first, how, how is this going for you? How's this feeling? How are you doing? A lot of times they're like, this is great. Sometimes not. Sometimes they feel like it's shaming to them. But we need to check in with them. Um, <laughs> we're not going to spend too much time on this, but it's mandatory. We've got to attend our counter-transference. We're going to have it. We're going to have it. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing bad. We just need to talk to somebody about it. When I worked here, Alex was wonderful, and, and uh, it's part of how you know we ran group together and whatnot. But it was one of the things that bonded us while I was getting to know her. I was like, I would knock on her door. You got a minute? And she knows that meant 15 minutes. And I was like, Look, can I just tell you what? Uh, I just heard something, and I'm really kind of it's it threw me, or I feel really like disgusted by this, or this or that. 
or how about erotic countertransference, right? What if you're feeling when they're talking about things and it's turning you on? That can happen too. Or you're attracted to the client. Any of these things. Did I put arousal? Yes. Um, we have to have people we can talk to, other clinicians, supervisors, anybody that it's safe to go and process with, but we have to. That's a gift to ourselves. I keep hitting the microphone. Okay, so what to tell them to do? Can you try to stop between now and the time I meet you next week? And I say, I'm asking a lot of you. I get that. Especially, I mean, if they're watching it daily, that's a huge life change. Can you try, or if not, can you do your best to limit your watching? And let's see how that goes. But when someone is, and there's many different schools of thoughts on this, the way that I worked here at CHS, the way I work with my practice, and my clients crave this, is an abstinence model, a sobriety model. There are more models, right? But when someone comes in and says, I can't stop and my life is ruined, for now, we got to get you clean from your drug. So. I would, for the first week, I mean, there's always a 30-day, 90-day trial period of no pornography, no masturbation. We could talk about that for an entire hour, about when is that right, when is that wrong. Can you try to stop? Let's see how it goes. If they stop, then they're not an addict, right? No, not right. It means they stopped for a week. Some can't. That's okay, too. Now, how do we meet that? <laughs> what did Alex say? It's like, have a kind heart, but carry a big stick, or whatever that beautiful saying is. It's like, how do we meet that with compassion, but also we care about them, and we want to see them get better? So say, ah, well, you, you watch it three times a day. All right, good job. Nice try. Well, we don't want to just say that. We don't want to minimize it, right? Because they're in, they're in trouble, and they're coming for help. So, so how do we deal with that? Well, that's up to our therapeutic style. That's up to each of us in the room but we want to encourage them to try to change their life. Expect withdrawal symptoms. Attend to them, normalize them, tell them ahead of time. I think this is going to be a hard week, Joe. It's okay if it is. Nothing's going wrong if you find yourself like, you know, coming out of your skin. That's normal. You've been relying on this thing and we're going to take it away. Be kind to yourself. Surround yourself with things that are going to be helpful and soothing this week. I believe in 12-step meetings. I've had porn addicts go to 12-step. SAA in LA is an enormous fellow. Well, actually, all three of these are enormous in LA. SCA is here as well. Um, there is no, well, there's no thriving community of just Porn Addicts Anonymous. That does, it, it exists, but it's just not here in LA, and, and I have, people have trouble finding it. So they go to one of these sex addict meetings. I've had people come and say, that sucked. Everybody's talking about cheating on their spouse. They're talking about hiring prostitutes. They're talking about child this and that. I just can't stop watching porn. I don't belong there. To which one of the things I might say is, can you go and listen for the similarities instead of the differences? This is someone who can't stop doing something of a sexual nature, and they want to stop. Other people have come back and said, I found my people. I've had people come back and say, I've never felt as little shame as I did sitting in that meeting. Because here are people, and by the way, this, this um, SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, their, uh, what do you call it, their motto is from shame to grace. Right? That's everything. So people coming back and saying, I kind of respected the guys in this meeting, and I thought they were pretty cool guys, and they were there for the same reason I was. So it's very normalizing. But I tell, tell people, don't try to do this alone. Even if it's not 12-step, do not do this alone. And that leads to, call me, let me know how it's going. My personal style, I say, I'm not going to call you back, but just, unless you say I need to talk to you, but just check in, leave me a message. Were you able to not watch porn? Call me halfway through the week, let me know. Because eventually I want them calling a sponsor if they're going to work a program. So let's start with you just leaving me a message. You're not alone in this. And then a web filter or a blocker. They exist. Anyone with, with is savvy, with tech savvy, they're going to be able to go around their blocker. They're going to disable it. They're gonna, some people even give the code to their spouse or their sponsor, their best friend, and then they find a way around it. Look, if you want to watch porn, you're going to watch porn. But this gives them a moment of pause. While they're trying to figure out how do I climb over this hurdle, that might make them say, maybe I shouldn't. It just puts, puts distance between them and their drug of choice. Reading. Go get one of these books. There are others. In the Shadows of the Net, Untangling the Web, Your Brain on Porn, The Porn Trap. This is much more it talks about, Gary Wilson talks about how pornography affects the brain. Someone, I know people who have read that and said, oh my God, I get, I get it now. I get myself now. Now I see what's been happening. I'm not just like, like alcoholics uh, 100 years ago. I'm not weak. I'm not a pervert. I'm not sick. I'm addicted. My brain is craving this. Porn Trap. 
And then online support and education, again, especially for the young people. Now, it's not, <laughs> it's not missed on me that you're telling somebody who's addicted to porn to get online and go look for help. Sure, that could be a trigger just itself. But all of these communities, NoFap and Reddit, Sex and Healing Relationship, um, Sex and Relationship Healing.com, Fight the New Drug, Your Brain on Porn, these are all websites that people can go to for support and help. And Sex and Relationship Healing.com is actually a website where they can do online groups for free, led by therapists, by the way. Um, and, and as well as um, CHS has this, this website has it, self assessments that they can go. They can read about the type, you know, other people. And the uh, websites for these places, of course, I say sometimes, hey, go on Sex Addicts Anonymous. Go Google it and see, does it relate? Does it resonate with you, what you read? And then program calls, eventually, eventually. This is after they've been to a uh, 12-step enough that I say, I want you to have that life preserver in your pocket. So you like Dan from this meeting, you like Susie from this meeting, like, call them when you're struggling. That's going to get you out of the hot water when you need it. Because the therapist isn't going to be, that is a 12-step thing. We serve a specific role. Me personally, I'm not on call. I'm not available when they need. Program brothers and sisters can be, can be, if the person decides to work 12-step. This is all down the road, right? As the, you continue to work with them, they consider, do they want to work the 12 steps? Do they want to get a sponsor if they're going to 12-step? Couples therapy, if indicated, many times it is. There's a lot of healing. By the way, is porn cheating? If, yeah, right. If we have five hours, we can figure, you know, in five hours, we won't figure that one out, right? It depends on the couple. That's it. To some, yes. To some, no. Uh, I've worked with couples where the partner feels as betrayed as if the person had sex with someone outside the marriage. Uh, all the power to that couple. If that's true for the partner, then that's true, period. The Gottman say that infidelity is anything that you hide or lie about from, uh, hide from your partner or lie about to your partner is infidelity. Well, this counts if people subscribe to that. So uh, processing intimacy issues from family of origin, we're about to talk about that, and redefining intimacy in relationships. So great, I've been medicating myself, I haven't had to be intimate, now what? Now what do I do? Because a lot of them say, and by the way, some of these people, especially some people in their 20s, they've never had a sexual relationship or never had a relationship at all. This has been taking care of them, so to speak, and they've never had, so they get in a room with a person or they go, how do I do this? How do I swipe or not swipe or walk up to somebody? Like, how do I do relationship? It's an earnest and valid question to work with them on. So what are the underlying emotions in porn addiction? So as I said, we're going to be talking, and it's going to be pretty quick, actually, because I'm looking at the time, of the type of emotions we can assess for or unresolved issues or trauma we can assess for in their family of origin, in their upbringing, and in their unresolved issues from the type of porn they watch. So I'm going to go back to countertransference. We need our own support. We need to have people we consult with. Specifically, for your sake, you can ask that they not give gory details because what you're asking them now, what types of pornography do you watch? And to be fair, I should have flipped these two. Check in with the client to see if that conversation is triggering to them. If you're sitting and talking about what you love to watch in porn, does that make that person jones and as soon as you're done they want to go watch this stuff? Check in and then check in again and then check in again as you're talking about it. Be compassionate and understanding like I said. I should have written that on every single page here because that's it. It's like can they tell you and you're going to listen to them and understand even if it's something that you think is abhorrent. Listen for the pain in their porn arousal template and compare it to their family or of origin history and trauma and use your countertransference. So someone might say, I like to watch older women with younger men and you might get a feeling of sadness and longing. Someone say, older women with younger men, you get a feeling of anger in the room. Okay, use it. Ask them questions about it. What about that? Is that exclusively? And by the way, some people go, oh God, I watch this, this, this. It doesn't matter. They just watch whatever. So this is, again, it's a window in, and we just take that journey with them. Um, my magic question that I ask people, this is whether they're triggered to watch porn or in the type of porn they watch is, if we could magically remove the arousal, what would you be feeling? If we could magically remove the arousal, what would you be feeling in this moment? I saw a man walking down the street. I was so turned on. He was so hot. I wanted to go watch porn. Cool. Magic question time. If you weren't turned on, what would you have to be feeling? 
50% of the time, it's, I don't know. Fair enough. The arousal is taking the place of them having to feel anything. And I'm not talking about just arousal. Like, some, we're just aroused. We're just turned on. That's okay. But triggered to the point where, like, I need my drug. I need to go to porn because I saw someone I'm really attracted to. A lot of time, it would be anger, loneliness, shame, inadequacy. I saw this beautiful person, and it made me feel bad about myself. So I want to watch porn. So I love that question, and sometimes it, it brings up some really uh, meaningful stuff. So emotions, we're going to go through each one of these, so I'm just going to go straight to it. Um, with your own therapeutic style, how do you work with clients? Right? Each of us could take a turn and talk about this is how I would work with this. Great. Then, then that's exactly what you should be doing. So eroticized rage, Patrick Carnes coined this term. And what it talks about is unresolved feelings of hurt and anger actually get wired into someone's arousal template. I'm angry, and instead of feeling, it's like projection, like we learn about projection, instead of dealing with and feeling all that anger and hurt, I'm going to turn it into what I'm attracted to, what I'm aroused by. So it becomes sexualized so that they're turned on instead of angry. Sounds like a good deal, you know what I mean? It's like, so I can't fault anybody for eroticizing their rage, but we can help them. And dominating, victimizing, or humiliating others becomes hot. I'm sure, okay, so in examples of porn, spitting, choking, gagging, humiliating, hurting, name calling, slapping, degrading, and many, 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 many more. It's hot. It's what I like. You know, that's what someone would say. Why do they like it? There's pain, or usually is pain, in that arousal template. Why do they like someone? Because some of these, if you took out the sex, you would just be watching a video of someone getting the shit beat out of them. If you took the sex out of it, right? But because it's sexual, it's like, oh, this is porn. This is what people want. It can be overt or covert. It can be someone being abused, or it can be something like, let's say, um, a stripper. And... I put, put this in the, in the next slide, is basically that someone can identify, oh, here it is, with either per, the, the performers. So let's say there's a stripper in a porn scene. Well, somebody could identify with he or she, let's say she, the stripper, has all the power. All the power. And this person is subservient. Someone else could watch and say, that person paying the stripper has all the power. Right? It's about deconstructing this or allowing that person to see where is the pain in what turns me on. If it's there. Like I said, sometimes it's an anomaly and sometimes there's just not a lot. But I have been able to, oh, and this is a huge one, huge, huge, huge with men I've worked with. They, the viewer gets to have, theoretically, the person that they never could get when they were younger. This is a junior high and a high school thing. Yeah, I could never get the hot um, quarterback of the football team. I could never get the beautiful cheerleader or the goth girl that I thought was so beautiful. I could never get them. I never felt good enough. There's inadequacy. But now I get to have that person. I get to see you naked. I get to see you doing all these things. For some, for some, just watching porn can be eroticized rage. And others, it's not. So an example, this is just one, get the client in touch with the hurt behind the anger. Let's talk about high school. Let's talk about what it felt like, your feelings of inadequacy. Let's talk about the shame. And let's go to the hurt and work on healing that through like inner child work is one of the many ways. Now, the, this next slide is right along with eroticized rage. I, these could have all been, I put shame and inadequacy, but they, they overlap tremendously. Look for themes of humiliation. Cuckled. A husband who's being cheated on. Someone wants to say, I love seeing that. That really turns me on. Wow, why? Because there's some pain in that story of someone being deceived and lied to. Degradation, minimization. Fetishes that reduce the performer to a nothing. There's a lot. Someone being you know, put on a chain, someone uh, being beaten, someone in a, in a very subservient position. And power. Very young. BDSM. Teacher, student, doctor, therapist. If someone always goes toward that, I'm interested in why. Right? Is there something about the power dynamic that is pulling you in where you're trying to work out something from your past where there's hurt or there's shame or there's inadequacy and this is the way you found to try to work through it. Um, I'm going to go a few minutes into our Q&A time. I hope that's okay. Um, example of what to do. An example. Process the client's childhood messages around shame and inadequacy and update the negative cognitive distortions and core beliefs. One example. That's CBT. So here's one way depending on our therapeutic style. 
God, I'm noticing when you're talking about this, um, I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling really sad. Are you feeling sadness around this? The person might say, nope, I'm good. Or they might say, yeah, I am too. Like, pay attention to your body. It's like they're telling you a story, in most cases, through what they're watching. Remember I said like the, the Jack Daniels versus Bud Light. There's information in here. Parental love and abandonment. Yep, I've worked with this. MILF porn, that is people having sex with mothers. Um, not their own. Uh, uh, in this step, this is all the rage now. I don't know if you know this. Stepmom, stepdad, stepsister, stepbrother. If you go to the, the YouTubes uh, of porn, when you haven't typed in anything, you just go there like what's hot, what's trending, what's now, it's almost exclusively this, at least on the front row. Yeah. So, for example, that could be a desire or a lack uh, of nurturing, right? Wanting to be with someone who cares and who's loving and stuff. It could be anger. You're having sex with your dad's wife, for example, in some of these. Like, that could be a vengeance, it could be anger, it could be a, a, an ina ina inadequacy. Someone who shouldn't be having sex with me is having sex with me if you identify with that person in the scene. So again, there's three examples of completely different emotional things that could be happening from just one type of pornography. So yet again, it's a map, but we go on these individual quests with them, right? We can't tell them without, without being curious and learning from them. And of course, like I said earlier, we're putting all this together with what we know about that client, what they've already told us. What story is this telling? Large sexual body parts, men with enormous penises might be someone's fetish. A uh, woman with enormous breasts might be a fetish, and is. Well, if we also know that there was a lack of over or an abundance of this in their childhood, or that they're missing that, or that they wanted to get away from it, you know, we have material to really process with them. Are they trying to work it out through this? Sometimes. And that's what we're talking about here. And then um, this is, a, you know, uh, I, I was going to say a stretch. It's not a stretch. But I have heard theories, and I kind of liked it, that transsexual pornography, and by the way, that's huge and animated right now. Huge. It's a it's, it's completely separate wing um, where they have animate a woman with full breasts and genitalia and an enormous penis and the, uh, the, the capability to ejaculate. So it's like a, it's a creature that doesn't exist, right? But, what, but it's enormous and it's blown up. Why? The answer is different for each person. But one of the things I've heard, and I like this, it was many years ago, is could they be drawn to the maternal of the breasts and also be yearning for the erect penis of what they missed in dad? One road to go down. If that fits for the client you're with. Now, you might hear that and say, that's just crazy. That's just kind of making something out of nothing. I don't know. It might be. But I've known people who, for this especially, it's like, yeah, they get to have uh, 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 the masculine and the feminine all in one. Example, explore the ways they were neglected in any of these or abandoned and work to heal those wounds through inner, inner parenting. Just being with the wound. And finally, trauma. Many scenes, of course, and fetishes can be trauma reenactments for the viewers, uh, any of these examples. Um, I heard someone, a woman, talk recently about her own experience. She was gang raped as a teen. Awful, awful story. And then as the years progressed, she found herself watching gang rape porn. And I think it took years and separation of doing it to go, oh my god, why that? Because a part of her was trying to work through this trauma not realizing it was never going to happen in this way, or not even realizing she was doing that on purpose. Um, as with all trauma, go slow. Don't push the client. Use your own therapeutic style. What interventions do you believe in? What modalities? And consider these modalities. I just listed a few. Inner child healing of memories, EMDR, somatic experiencing, and others. But the important thing is to make the implicit explicit. And it takes time, and it takes patience, and it takes compassion. Be who you are as a clinician, right? I, I mean, it's like we're, we're, I spent the, my first year or two at CHS trying to be Alex Katahakis. Want to know how well I did? I sucked at it. I was okay, sure, I was good. But it's like when I decided to be Greg as a clinician, then I started seeing a lot more change in the clients I worked with. And then I started enjoying it more. I started being me. I was better at being me than I was at trying to be Alex. Nobody can be Imagine Alex. That. What's that? Imagine that, right. <laughs> So be you in all that we're talking about here. These are examples. These are pathways you can take, right? But you're the clinician. Yeah. Yeah. 
There's not one way to discover these. There's not one way to treat them. Go on that journey with your client. You've heard me say many times, compassion, unconditional positive regard are extremely healing, especially when talking about something so deep and tender and meaningful for these people. Consult, 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 get your consultation, take care of your counter-transference, and if you're stuck, call somebody. Hey, I got this client, can we talk through it? And finally, monitor and tend, oh, I just said that, to your counter-transference, so take care of yourself. Now, if you're looking for an amazing podcast, and what I work for sometimes, brave new man, um, it's, uh, it's, it's relatively new, it's about three months uh, old, um, and I, uh, a lot of my clients who I work with, once they get sober or once they stop acting in this uh, compulsive and addictive way, they are asking themselves, what the fuck is masculinity? What is being a man? I've been filling myself with this toxic version of this, but what does it mean to actually uh, uh, be a man today? How do I be in my masculine but not hurt people? I say, I might have a podcast for you. So feel free to subscribe um, and uh, follow us on Instagram if you want. You might know this woman here, Alex Katahakis. She was on the show about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. We talked about what is sexual consent. Um, and it's a beautiful, like, uh, 40, 50 minute conversation. Um, and it gives, uh, you know, little amazing things. And here's us all at, uh, at the symposium. Um, and then if you ever have questions, please feel free to email. Email's quicker, probably. I can get it. I can respond to it in a quicker way than to return a phone call. But please use me as a resource if you want. Obviously, CHS is an amazing resource. Uh, I love and respect them. And um, for the moment, thank you guys very much. Um, We have about seven minutes. Are there questions or even thoughts? Yeah, question. Um, during the 30 day or the 90 day break, yeah. um, it was no point and no masturbation. What about sex? Good question. Um, which is why I said we take, it takes hours to, to really thoroughly, but let me, this is a good question. Um, first of all, you need, if they're in a relationship, you need the partner's consent. The partner has to agree, yes, let's do this, let's try this together. Um, they can't come home and say, oh, my therapist said I can't have sex with you. So I would say if they're in a relationship, a lot of the time the answer is yes. It's relational. <laughs> it can be as long as it is relational between the two of them. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I would say. If they're single, I would, I would challenge them not to. They usually break that, but you know. Question? Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, you, you were mentioning before when someone asked you directly, am I a sex, am I, am I a porn addict? Mm -hmm. And you want to be gentle and compassionate. How do you and your style answer that? Um, it looks uh, from everything uh, you've answered and everything I'm hearing and in my experience, I think you are. Okay. Yeah. Answer directly on yep. Experience. That's my assessment. And then I would, I do check in. How does that match what you were thinking when you came in here today? Most of the time they say, yeah, I kind of knew that, but I just want to get an, you know, an official response. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have a question about a um, sexual function related to porn. So, yeah. Um, somebody that I'm working with, he can have an erection in real life, mm -hmm. but he can't perform. He has yeah. an orgasm. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Delayed ejaculation. Well, he just can't. Can't have ejaculation. Right. Yeah. And which is, he likes because, you know, it's fantasy free. It's all, of course. He, he, can, he can perform in that That's right. setting. I've said this to a lot of, of people I've worked with. Like, porn never said, uh, you're too big, you're too small, you can't last long enough, you're not a good lover, you don't give me the best orgasm, you're too fat, you're too thin. Porn doesn't judge you. Also, I've had clients um, refer to, like, when they're masturbating to porn obsessively, it's like they have their death grip if it's a man masturbating. So then what happens when they're having sex with somebody that doesn't have that? I mean, that does, the, the death grip doesn't exist. They're not in control of it. So, um, so some people can only orgasm if they're addicted to pornography, if they're fantasizing about porn. Um, others can't at all, and others have no problem. So... Um, did I answer your question? Well, yeah, I don't know that there's a simple answer. I'm yeah. just thinking about how to approach this. Yeah. It's fear of like fear of performance. Sure. That's really what it's about yeah. for him. So he I would say, those. yeah, of course. I would work with the anxiety and I'd work with the fear. Um, sex and porn addiction, they're an intimacy disorder. Um, so I would absolutely work, I would normalize that and tell the person, it's like, yeah, this is what you've been avoiding. 
So bless your heart, now you're in it, right? Now you're dealing with this uh, with another person, with another human being in the room. Um, so uh, it's, you know, uh, premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation, and erectile dysfunction can be anxiety. I mean, really produced by anxiety, so I would work with the anxiety. Um, and, and really, like, and I guess I would also process the, the fear of intimacy. Where did that come from? How do we work on that? I would acknowledge male, female, doesn't matter. There's intimacy here in the room. Like, this is intimate. We're sitting in a room talking to each other about very deep and meaningful things. Is that scary to you? How is this different than when you're with a physical partner? Now, that's different <laughs> based on gender. We all have that conversation differently with our clients. Um, but yeah, I would just go right to the core, the core of the fear. What are you afraid of? They probably say, I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's the way I would work with it. Um, thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.